Today, we talk about morality. If you recall from last session, we talked about unethicality and morality, but we focused many, mainly on unethicality. Uh, we had two ways of looking at unethicality. One was unethical behavior. So a behavioral ethics approach to studying how people behave in uh, unethicality, even if most people try to hide their unethicality. So how do we assess this sort of thing uh, in the lab in the field. And then in addition to that, looking at some judgment and decision-making um, projects, some of the replications that we've done were about uh, unethicality, some of them about morality. Today, we'll focus mostly on morality. To remind you what we went through in the last session, um, we made a differentiation between ethics and morality according to this very broad criteria and definition. Generally, unethical behavior is more the clear violation of norms, regulations, and laws. So there's broadly a, a, clear, a clear definition of what is allowed and what is forbidden. And then some people cross that line, uh, thereby engaging in unethical, unapproved uh, behavior. Morality is more about interpretation. So something is vague, something is undefined. And then in terms of what is the right thing to do, people have different criteria that they um, assign in order to, uh, to make judgments of that. And sometimes people from different backgrounds, from different perspectives, have a very different view on exactly the same topic. So this cartoon over here really captures uh, you know, the judgment uh, of, of one group with one type of morality over the other groups. Um, so the in-group and the out-group, how you uh, assess morality, how you evaluate others' morality, whether you apply judgment to that or not. Today's session is going to be on the right side, on morality and the interpretation. And we're going to begin by asking you to go again on the Mentimeter and share some of your own uh, morality. So if we just open this up, we are going to answer some questions about the trolley dilemma. So I think most of you by now are very familiar with the trolley dilemma. It's a classic, it's from the 1960s. Um, maybe some of you are even tired of trolley dilemmas by now because it, become, it became the most common way of assessing morality. The nice thing about this is that it's a simplified scenario that gives you a very clear choice between two options. So I'm gonna read this together with you. Bear with me in the first one. Once we go through this, each one of the following trolley dilemmas is going to complicate this a little bit further. So even if this looks simple to you, and perhaps you've answered this many times before, just answer this once again for me. And then I think you'll see the point of what it is that we're trying to do as we go through similar scenarios. So what's happening over here? So we have this runaway trolley. It's going from the left to the right, and it's on path to run over these uh, five people here. It could be that they are tied up or they're incapacitated or they're just not paying attention. So you're holding a, a lever which is connected to these tracks. And then you have the ability to uh, pull the lever, thereby uh, causing the trolley to go on a side track, which is bound to hit one person who is not paying attention or is incapacitated. So the only way for you to prevent uh, these five people from uh, dying, from the trolley running over them, is to pull the lever and have it go and run over the one person. So the two options are do nothing, allow the trolley to kill the five people on the main track, or you pull the lever and thereby diverting the trolley onto the side track will, will kill this one person, but preventing the deaths of five persons on the track. What will you do? To some, this is a somewhat uh, stressful situation. It's not fun to contemplate the prospect of being responsible for people's lives, for people's deaths. Um, but as you will see throughout this session, 
the trolley dilemma really can be applied to many types of scenarios that we experience in real life. So um, if this is stressful for you, you don't have to, to participate, but I think it's a good exercise for you to contemplate what kind of person you are, what would you do in this kind of situation? And then later, when we are looking at real life scenarios, think how to map what it is that you've answered here to what it is that actually happens in real life and how you make decisions over there. So hopefully by now you've, you've answered this. Um, if you have any questions or things that you wanna comment, you can now do this on the Mentimeter and we'll move on to the next uh, trolley dilemma problem. So now I'm gonna show you a variation of this. It's gonna be a slight twist to this whole thing. Now, instead of a lever and having uh, the ability to divert the trolley, what we have right now is this bridge that is over the tracks. So we have the same scenario where the trolley is racing down the tracks. It cannot be stopped, the brake is broken, and it's going to run over these five, uh, these five people. Uh, but then you're standing on the bridge just above the tracks and you're seeing this kind of situation and you're standing over there with a stranger. Now this stranger, um, you don't know this stranger, but you can uh, decide if you want to, uh, push the stranger off the trail, off the, off the bridge to hit the, 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 the tracks and thereby stopping in the trolley. So it's again, the one person against the five people, but here, instead of just pulling a lever and indirectly causing uh, the, the trolley to divert, here you have to physically push a, a man off of the bridge. So that's that's a different uh, take on this on this whole on this whole thing. Um, so I don't know what you answered over here, but would you answer exactly the same on on this new scenario? Um, same thing, a stranger, somebody that you don't know, but here it involves a physical action of you actually um, pushing a man to um, to his death. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, now, the same kind of scenario, exactly the same scenario, but the thing is, is that usually when people contemplate the trolley dilemma, and when I see this being taught, uh, very rarely do I see uh, people asking, okay, why, why push the poor man off the bridge when there's also the possibility of you just uh, uh, jumping off the bridge? So I said, okay, why not? Let's put exactly the same kind of scenario, but instead of pushing the stranger, how about you have the option of just jumping off the bridge and blocking the trolley yourself? So the two options here are do nothing, allow the trolley to kill five people or jump off the bridge onto the tracks blocking the trolley and it will 100% stop the trolley uh, thereby saving these five, five people but will result in your death. So. Over here, if you compare the previous one to this one, it's the matter of you want to prevent the five people being killed and perhaps you are um, pre preferring the one casualty to five casualties, but instead of whether it's one other person or five other persons, and you can consider whether it's five other persons or yourself. Um, do you value your life more than the stranger? Um, perhaps the, the opposite. So um, this adds an additional twist to this. So now you can see that this very simple decision between do nothing and do something uh, creates a situation that you can really contemplate from um, some complicated, complicated things in, in regards to morality. And you can think about what would you answer? What would other people answer? Uh, what would you think about other people if they would answer one or they would answer two? Would you expect that people would answer exactly the same thing about these three uh, different scenarios? Uh, or would they have different criteria on how to evaluate this sort of thing? What is the guiding principle in your life for how you assess this type of morality? Now, if we take all of this together, Let's try and rank our preferences, our morality principles in this one scenario. So I try to take one scenario that would allow you any possibility. And then I want you to rank these options 
rather than just saying which one you will choose. So here you have you, a friend and a stranger, all standing on this bridge that we saw here before. So rather than just you and a stranger, now there's also a friend in there. And once again, you see this runaway trolley moving towards the, the five people um, who, are, who are unaware of the, the trolley coming. It's gonna hit them. Now, you know that if you jump off the bridge, uh, it will stop the trolley. You know that if you push the stranger or if you push your friend, it will stop the, the trolley. Uh, so you have a few, a few options over here. Which of the following would you prefer? How would you rank these? So once again, you have the options of just not, like not doing anything and just allowing the trolley to kill the five people on the track. You also uh, have the ability, just like before, to push the stranger off the bridge. You also have the ability to push your friend off the bridge and you have the ability to self-sacrifice, uh, jumping off the bridge and blocking it. Now, of all of that, now we have an additional two options of you just let somebody else decide. Would you rather not having to make this kind of decision? Uh, you can let either the stranger decide, somebody that you don't know, or you can let your friend who you know and um, trust make this kind of decision. And just keep in mind that if you let the stranger decide or you let your friend decide, they can decide any of these uh, things. They can also decide to sacrifice you. They can decide to sacrifice uh, themselves. They can decide to sacrifice the stranger. So uh, here there's an additional complexity of would you want to engage in this kind of decision? Do you want to take this kind of responsibility or do you want to delegate it to somebody else? If you want to delegate this to somebody else, who would you rather delegate this to? Uh, the stranger? Or, or the friend. Now, as you contemplate these things, I'm gonna go back to the first one and see uh, what we've answered in the most classic of the trolley dilemma. So this is really uh, the, the most famous, most popular, most common uh, scenario. So let's see what it is that you've, that you've answered. So it seems like we have a split class. Uh, we have four and four. Four of you would do nothing and allow the trolley to kill the five people on the main track and four of you will, uh, will actually pull the lever and divert the trolley to kill uh, the one person. Uh, already you can like think about this. So what do the people who, uh, the students who chose this one, what do you think about the people in this other group and the people uh, over here on this group, what do you think of the people on the other group? But it's already interesting to see that we, it's not a clear cut. It's not like 100% of us agree on this type of morality. Uh, we have a split and we have a disagreement about this. We can sit and discuss what is the right thing to do, what we would do in this kind of situation, but you can already see that morality is complicated. There's no clear cut on what is right and what is wrong over here in this kind of scenario. Now, if we shift over to uh, this uh, stranger situation, so it's supposed to be, if, if, if it's just five people versus the one person, then we should have a four by four split, right? So let's see uh, the eight that participated, what did they choose? So suddenly we had two persons who previously chose uh, to divert and kill one person over the five, who are now saying that they will do uh, nothing. I'm assuming that all the others have kept the preferences. So uh, two, it seems like two, if all the others kept, two shifted from this category to this category. So there is something about this scenario and about you having to actively engage in pushing somebody to their, uh, to their death rather than pulling a lever and indirectly that caused some people to shift uh, shift their preferences towards uh, do, doing nothing. So it already shows you that morality is complicated in the sense that it's not always us looking at the number of people involved in lives saved or uh, lives lost, but it also involves some factors about the context. It involves what the situation is and what you would have to engage in if you want to uh, achieve a certain outcome. So that's interesting. Moving on to the, to the third one. 
Um, so now instead of you pushing the stranger, there's the ability of you to self-sacrifice. So if this would be exactly the same as the one before, then we would expect it would be 16 to if it's only the circumstances and only the issue of one versus five, then we'll see six and two. Let's see what the result is when you contemplated, uh, you know, sacrificing yourself. We have five and two. So one of you didn't, but it seems pretty, pretty close. So it seems like the two over here. So actually we have one that's shifted. So the, the people over here that were uh, kind of shifted towards uh, doing nothing, uh, are, are willing to, to sacrifice themselves rather than sacrificing. At least one of you uh, is willing to sacrifice themselves over sacrificing a complete stranger. So that's really interesting. So what leads people to, to choose self-sacrifice uh, over um, you know, harming another, another person? Uh, but we can still see that there's this preference over here to, to do, doing nothing. It involves a, a much um, you know, a physical contact or something that's a, a physical action of you choosing to do something in order to, to prevent, prevent this, uh, this death. Now let's see about the, 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 the complex rankings that I've asked you uh, to, to do over here. What would you prefer in this kind of situation? Would you uh, prefer to self-sacrifice? Would you prefer to uh, sacrifice a stranger or a friend, perhaps do nothing? Or, and these are the more interesting in this kind of a ranking, would you let somebody else decide? And if you let somebody else decide, who would you rather decide this sort of thing? So let's have a look at this. Most of you, or the, the number one preference, number one and number two, is either to do nothing and allow the trolley to kill, or let the, the friend decide. So, um, seems like you either would rather not have this choice at all or choose not to do uh, not to do an anything um, and looking at the third one push a stranger off and follow so but these are very very close to to one another let the stranger decide or push the stranger uh, jump off a bridge these are kind of categories but the last one seems a bit uh, far far off in the back and that is to push your friend off the bridge. So we seem to have, you know, a preference for, uh, you know, sacrificing ourselves and a stranger to sacrificing somebody who is in our in-group, uh, somebody who is a friend, somebody that we know um, and that we know and obviously trust because uh, our second, first second, it's almost the same is to let that friend, that friend decide. So that already reveals something really interesting about even with trolley dilemmas, we can look at these kinds of scenarios and see what it says about our in-group morality, how much we care uh, about uh, others, close others around us, and how much we uh, trust them to uh, make these kinds of, of decisions uh, for us. But I think this, this uh, says something about our preference to, to do nothing when there's the potential of harm. So if we recall from last week, we talked about our successful application of omission bias. And omission bias is somewhat related to this in the sense that um, if there's the potential of harm, we prefer harm through uh, inaction over harm through action. So by taking action, it seems like action is associated with higher responsibility, uh, moral accountability, uh, deliberation, intent. So all of this can be seen both in the ranking over here and in all of the other uh, responses, there's the majority of people who prefer to do nothing, even though at the beginning, the first one, it was kind of like a, a mixed uh, split, split half and half. But as we uh, increase the level of, you know, the causality, the connection between what it is that uh, we do and the possible death of someone, then people tend to shift towards inaction. And if you recall, aside from omission bias, we also discussed the preference for indirect harm. So people would prefer harm through inaction over uh, action, and then people would prefer indirect harm to direct harm. So generally through the trolley dilemma, we can also achieve some replications of classic effect in judgment and decision-making. Now, if we go back, to our scenarios over here. So um, 
we, we discussed uh, what these scenarios say. So we have a stranger or we have a self-sacrifice. If you thought that was uh, unrealistic, uh, or perhaps, uh, you know, what are the chances that, uh, so, well, where is the runaway trolley? What kind of trolley loses the brakes? What are the odds that five people are standing on, on a track? What, is, what are the odds that you are the one who has the lever and could, could, could change things? What are the odds that you're on, on a bridge and are just uh, happen to be together with a stranger or a friend and can push just to know 100% will stop the trolley? That seems a little bit far-fetched. So uh, this seems like a nice thought experiment, but it doesn't seem to have real implications. So if we go back to F uh, Philippa Foote, who initiated these trolley dilemmas, she gave a, a very good example of how these trolley dilemmas can happen in everyday situations in real life. So consider rather than a trolley with tracks and, and you, know, you with a lever and pushing people off the, the bridge, just consider this kind of scenario. So how about five patients at the hospital who are expected to die soon? And this happens in almost every hospital almost every day. Now, assume that there's a sixth man who comes in just to take a, a routine checkup at the same hospital. Now, the transplant surgeon who is in charge of these five patients says that the only way to save these five patients is to slay the sixth person who came in for a routine checkup, take his healthy organs and transplant those into the five. So suddenly you have you know, it's not pushing uh, somebody off, off a bridge. Uh, Self-sacrifice is not relevant here because we just have like the surgeon who we need his expertise in order to conduct this. But now there are real life implications because these people are really about to die. This happens every day in every hospital. Uh, we have these situations where we need organs. We need something in order to help these people um, recover. Uh, rather than die, but we can't just go around uh, slaughtering innocent people who came out for their routine checks. So suddenly we realize that this uh, trolley dilemma that seems very far-fetched, actually we can see all sorts of instances for these sort of things in our everyday life. And the question is, what would be the morally right thing to do? Who gets to decide over here? Should we let the transplant surgeon decide whether to slaughter this uh, sixth uh, person and save the five patients? Should we uh, make sure that uh, by law, this, this, is, uh, this is forbidden? If it's forbidden, are we morally responsible for the deaths of the five patients that we could have saved? So a lot of complicated issues over here. So with a very, very simple scenario, you can see uh, one page, uh, very few words that captures a very complex moral moral dilemma. Now, to summarize these things with a moral dilemma using trolley uh, problem, I want to show you a summary, a quick summary video. <laughs> A runaway train is heading towards five workers on a railway line. There's no way of warning them, but you're standing near a lever that operates some points. Switch the points and the train goes down a spur. Trouble is, there's another worker on that bit of track too, but it's one fatality instead of five. Should you do that? Many people think the right thing to do would be to switch the points, to sacrifice one to save five, since that produces the best outcome possible. Now imagine the train heading for the workers again. This time it can only be stopped by pushing a very large man off a bridge. His great bulk would stop the train, but he'd die. Should you do that? Most people say no. But why not? Both thought experiments are cases of sacrificing one to save five. What the trolley problem examines is whether moral decisions are simply about outcomes or about the manner in which you achieve them. Some utilitarians argue that the two cases are not importantly different from each other. Both have similar consequences, and consequences are all that really matter. In each case, one person dies and five are saved. The best option in each harrowing situation. But lots of people say they would switch the points, but they wouldn't push the man off the bridge. Are they simply inconsistent, or are they onto something? So 
if you think, okay, so we know these trolley dilemmas, we've answered a bunch of them. Um, we've known them since the 1960s. So we invented a, a, a few more. What's, what's interesting about this and, and how is this related to uh, social psychology? We get, we get that social psychology uh, studies morality sometimes, but what, can, what else can we say about the social aspect of this thing about uh, the trolley dilemmas? And the nice twist that I saw recently, some of the people that I know who are more psychologists add to the trolley dilemmas, and I thought that was really clever, is the question of how do you feel about others and the way that they answer these uh, trolley dilemmas? So if we go back to the um, Mentimeter, the following question is, which of the two would you trust more? Um, so the utilitarian is someone who answered that the right thing to do in a trolley dilemma is to pull the lever. The ontologist Somebody who answered that the right thing to do is to not pull the lever or not do anything, just let the trolley uh, do its thing. The question is, of these two people, who would you trust more? Now, given that our previous uh, answers was about split half and half, it would be interesting to see what in general uh, would, would you trust uh, more in this kind of situation. So the first question is about trust. The second question is about uh, preference for your romantic long-term partner, uh, whatever gender um, that, that may be. Uh, so um, trust is one thing, but let's say as a romantic partner, do you have a preference for whether you want your long-term romantic partner to be a utilitarian or would you rather this be a dentologist? People have done research on this. <laughs> Some of the people that I know in uh, moral psychology um, so we've got uh, Jim Everett here and Millie Crockett working with uh, Dave. Uh, Dave, interesting, he has a podcast called The Very Bad Wizards, uh, where he contemplates, so he's a social psychologist, but he does the podcast with a, a philosopher, and they discuss a lot of things about uh, moral psychology. So it's interesting in that they are the first ones to look at whether people prefer utilitarians uh, or uh, dontologists. And what they've shown is that across five studies, they've shown that people make characteristically uh, dentological judgments um, preferred, uh, preferred as social partners, perceived as more moral and trustworthy and are trusted more in economic uh, games. And uh, when we look at uh, this one over here, so it was published around uh, the, so it was done around the same time, but uh, this group over here on the left uh, was uh, faster to, to arrive at the uh, publication. So uh, they had to, the ones on the right had to reframe their uh, publication as a replication study. So overall, the present studies confirmed the main finding uh, that ontologists are more trusted than utilitarians in, in social uh, dilemma, dilemma games. At least according to uh, these two, one frame is sort of the original and the other one is a conceptual replication. It seems like uh, people don't like uh, utilitarian uh, others. Uh, they prefer the dontologists uh, for, for some reason. Uh, and they go into uh, looking at issues of trust and picking uh, people as long-term partners, so partner choice regarding moral intuition. So. If you think that moral psychology is only about the way that people make their own decisions, it's also about the social context of how do, other, how do others um, judge your moral decisions? How do you judge others for their moral uh, decisions? What kind of preferences uh, do you do? And I think especially now when we consider the differences in morality between say uh, Democrats and, and liberals um, or uh, uh, sorry, the Democrat liberals versus Republican and conservative. So it's really interesting to see that that worldwide political divide and the uh, associated uh, morality tends to really be an issue for uh, romantic partners and, and level of trust. So whatever uh, you know, political affiliation you have, let's say if in, you're in the US or some other place and you learn that somebody has a certain political affiliation, uh, what, would, what would that 
mean for you? Would that mean that they're less of a prospect for a long-term partner, less of a prospect that to be a, a good friend? Uh, perhaps you just need to avoid uh, discussing politics at, at all costs. So it seems like political issues, moral issues associated with political issues tend to really uh, reflect uh, fundamental things in our in our psyche in the way that we judge and evaluate others, just like in the first cartoon that I that I showed you. Now, this the question is: so, what what does judging others uh, mean? When do we judge others? Uh, do do we need to judge others? Um, and when we when we look at the decision that has, somebody has made, do we have the capacity? To really put ourselves in in that kind of situation, uh, and I I found this a very interesting example, which is very relevant to what's happening right now uh, in in the U.S. Uh, so there's the election going on right now where uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden head to head. Results are coming in uh, now. There's occasionally Republicans, Democrats, kind of differ on the way they treat issues like pro-life, pro-choice, and handling of guns. So I'm not sure why this is happening in the US, but every once in a while, some madman goes into a school or a movie theater, or just roaming the streets and then starts shooting people. And then the question is, is like how, how to best deal with this? Should we give people more guns in order to protect from this? Should we take away guns altogether? It's a very controversial and somewhat uh, morally uh, laden uh, topic. But uh, what I what was interesting about this Florida shooting, a very unfortunate event, is that some of the officers who were on the scene uh, did not did not go into into those schools. Some of them had guns, some of them did not have guns. So for example, this cop who didn't enter the school during the Florida shooting uh, had to resign. Uh, and then he got slammed as a coward by Donald Trump. So I'm just going to show you the Trump reaction to uh, what happened with these with these cops, and we, we can we can discuss what this means about how we evaluate other people's morality and what we would have done if we would be in this kind of situation. You know, I got to watch some deputy sheriffs performing this weekend. They weren't exactly uh, Medal of Honor winners. All right. The way they performed was, frankly, disgusting. They were listening to what was going on. The one in particular, he was then, he was early. Then you had three others that probably a similar deal a little bit later, but a similar kind of a thing. You know, I really believe, you don't know until you test it, but I think I, I really believe I'd run in there even if I didn't have a weapon. And I think most of the people in this room would have done that too because I know most of you. But the way they performed was, was really a disgrace. So that's interesting. You never know it until you test it. And the question is, what can we do in order to test Donald Trump in this kind of situation? So Donald Trump is convinced that if he was the one on the scene, even without a weapon, he would just storm in and try to prevent the shooting. Um, it's a little bit like uh, the trolley dilemma in the sense that some people are going to get killed and then you have the ability to perhaps self-sacrifice. You don't know, it's a bit more uncertain if you'll be able to stop this or not. It's not a 100% assurance, but this is really a trolley dilemma in real life. Um, Donald Trump saw how people reacted in real life to their trolley dilemmas in this Freud shooting. And he judged them disgusting, it's disgraceful. And this is not coming from just anybody. This is coming from the president of the United States. And, and he's also convinced that not only himself, you know, would sacrifice himself, but also everybody else that is in this room because he knows them. And the question is, let's say that we would want to test this kind of intuition rather than just presenting Donald Trump with a trolley dilemma. Uh, we would like, as social psychologists, now we've done our, our assessment, uh, we're doing our replications and extensions, we want to test this in real life, and we want to see whether people uh, will actually follow up on what it is that they say that they will do. How to do this sort of thing? How do we test real life behavior without creating a Florida shooting, without creating a trolley 
a, a trolley dilemma? Can we do a trolley dilemma? Uh, are there some ethical concerns uh, about this? So as social psychologists, if we want to do real life behavior and look at morality, it becomes very, very complicated. For a very long time, I thought that the trolley dilemma is something uh, hypothetical, uh, but turns out that some uh, clever folks have been able to test the trolley dilemma in real life. Uh, one of those uh, is this uh, team in Ghent University, uh, who I know. Uh, one of them even visited us here at the uh, University of Hong Kong uh, last year, uh, just before madness set in in, in Hong Kong. So uh, they came, he came in, he presented some interesting stuff to us uh, over here. And one of the most interesting papers, and I think this is his uh, most cited uh, paper, uh, is in psychological science. And this is called Of Mice, Men, and Trolleys. So uh, on one side, looking at hypothetical judgments. Uh, on the other side, looking at real life behavior. So as a first step, he gave people a bunch of uh, trolley dilemmas, just like I gave you uh, at the beginning. And then, you know, people are saying, okay, but, you know, there's a big difference between how people answer hypothetical judgments and how people act in real life. And then he said, I'm actually going to go and look at how they did things in real life. Doing this sort of thing with humans is, is problematic in terms of uh, the potential for harm or what people experience when they think that they are in charge of a decision or whether to harm another person or not is, is complex. But he came up with a, an interesting twist to this by using mice. So um, what he did was is that once, once people answered the hypothetical judgment, they were taken to a room where there were mice who can uh, get electric uh, shocks. And there was one uh, cage with uh, uh, five of them. And there was another cage with another, uh, another mouse over there. And then uh, the participants were informed that within a specific time, so there's a countdown, the, the five will be shocked unless the person pushes a button and then only the one will be shocked. At the end, and this is important to clarify, uh, no mice were hurt in this uh, experiment. So at the end, this involved deception. Sometimes we have to deceive our participants, but as we deceive, we also have, have to uh, think about you know, the distress that they might feel. So he thought instead of doing this with people, which is very distressful, I'm going to simulate this uh, with mice. And at the end, tell them, don't worry, uh, no mice were hurt. But uh, people really feel like this is about to take place. And what they found is, is that there was actually quite a weak association between what people said they would do and what people actually did. So our results indicate that responses to hypothetical dilemmas are not predictive of real life dilemma behavior. So uh, perhaps um, Donald Trump, <laughs> when he says that, uh, you know, he answers the trolley dilemma in a certain way, perhaps when he's faced with a real life uh, dilemma, he would not uh, act exactly in the same way. Uh, what, what it is uh, predictive of is affective and cognitive aspects of real life decisions. So the level of, uh, of distress, the contemplation, other things. So fascinating, fascinating paper and, and done by a, a PhD student. I think now he's, he's a postdoc uh, also still at, at Ghent. So uh, even as a PhD student, you see something that's been done many times since the 1960s, and you think, what else can I add to this? Uh, you need to ask yourself, is there a specific twist that hasn't been done on this? Can we do an extension on this? Uh, what hasn't been addressed yet? What can I study that is very valuable that actually hasn't been studied before? So well done, Ghent team. A very, very interesting paper. Uh, this was 2018 and just when, even before this came out, when it came out as a preprint, people got really upset with this sort of thing. So you see a big, uh, big response to this. So I know some of these people personally, some of them are part of our team. Uh, so a lot of moral psychologists did not like this kind of conclusion. Some of them had some uh, statistical uh, things to say about the analysis that were done. Some of them had some objections to, you know, the actual research question 
of uh, misunderstanding of what the trolley dilemmas are supposed to do. So a really interesting debate, and you would think that we would have solved this sort of debate a while back, given that this has been running since the 1960s. But even now, 2018, all this time, uh, we still have a lot of debate to which they, of course, uh, responded. Um, <laughs> should trolleys be scared of mice? So they reply to all of these uh, together. So very, very interesting debate, regardless of what you think about the, the whole debate about what trolley dilemmas actually capture, uh, there's no doubt that this is a fascinating um, study and a contribution to our literature taking, taking a, a twist. Um, how about video games? Was it done with that? So yes, it, it's very nice that, that, you raised, <laughs> that you raised this. Um, yeah, so that's one of the, we have, a, we have a VR lab here. Did you know? Did you use our VR lab? So we have a VR lab over here where you can actually uh, put in some of these things. And some of, uh, some of the researchers that I know have actually used virtual reality in order to test these kinds of, of, of behaviors. But even in the VR, uh, people know that this is uh, VR, so it still makes it a bit hypothetical. There's a bit more of the distress, like it depends on how how realistic the VR is. Uh, even the best of the VRs that I've seen doesn't feel completely realistic, which uh, kind of leads me to, to the question of, can, can we test this in like real life? Can we test this not just with mice, but also with men? Um, and for a very long time, uh, I thought the answer to that was, uh, yeah, electric shock is not like killing people. So do you want to see one that actually involves killing people? Um, <laughs> because it has been done. Uh, so I'm going to show you one more. Uh, here we go. So I thought that this was going to be the most extreme. I think to get an ethical approval for uh, get, getting this uh, to be done with uh, actual people uh, was going to be impossible. But guess who did it? A TV show, a TV show decided to pull this off and somehow they got uh, IRB approval. I'm going to show you how they did this. <laughs> First, I'm going to show you the setup of how they pull this off. And then I'm going to show you one of the many participants. They did, I think, seven or eight. It's not a representative sample. It wasn't meant for a, a real psychology study. It was meant to, as a TV show, to show people the complexity in these kinds of situations. But this goes to show they've actually, they went, they talked to psychologists, they went through an ethical board. A lot of people criticize these psychologists and the ethical board, but they've done this, so we can learn from this. So let's have a look at what the setup was, shall we? This is where we're going to physically create the trolley problem in real life. Not with a trolley, but with a train. Our subjects will sign in at this booth for our phony focus test, which will never actually take place. It's going to be a hot day for them, so we'll offer them, while they wait for the actual test to begin, the chance to sit inside this nice air-conditioned remote switching station. Inside, they'll meet a kindly train switch operator, supposedly an employee of the California Railroad Authority. The California Railroad Authority is real. Real fake. We invented this non-existent government organization to convince our subjects that everything here is real, including these monitors showing supposedly live shots of actual trains from different tracks all around the California area. While the participant is waiting inside this room, they'll learn how the operator switches the tracks using a lever to remotely switch a train from one track to another. They'll see it happen. We're actually controlling the video on these screens from a different hidden control room. At a given time, the switch operator will leave the subject alone in the switching station. And at that point, a crisis will occur. A train will be barreling down the tracks and workers will have made their way out to both tracks, five on one, one worker on his phone on the other. No one is around for them to alert who has any kind of control or authority. Switching the train is up to the subject alone. They'll feel like what they do has real world consequences. Will five people die or will one? 
okay this this was the setup so i'm gonna fast forward and show you some of the uh, participants one of the participants and the way that this participant reacted which highlights the complexity the ethical complexity of running these kinds of of designs Let, let's have a look it is quite the test. At this point, one subject had switched the tracks and five others had not. But we weren't done yet. Meet Corey. Here, have a seat. Much obliged, thank huh. you. This is cool. This whole module will interconnect with the entire nation if we wanted it to. Right. You know, but right now we're looking at just track one on the left, track two through there. Nice. These are many, many miles away, Yeah. Uh, but uh, they're all live feeds. Surveying the scene, Eagle's point of view. Yeah. Let me see what this is. Okay, I'll be right back. Okay, got it. He's remaining engaged. Here come the workers. Oh, no. Attention. Object on track. Uh, yeah. So he realizes there's a potential problem. I think he's gonna go out. Attention, train approaching. Um, there's a train coming. Um, okay. Realizes there's no one there, it's urgent. Okay, so he needs to go to. Okay, he's rehearsing what to do. Oh, um, track two. Do they not know? Uh, I know, uh, they should see this. Oh. Get out. End of test. Okay, good. Everyone is safe. Hello. Hi, Corey. Hey. Or, My name's Mike. Um, there was just a uh, almost an accident, seemingly. Corey, everything that just happened was an experiment. Okay. No one was in danger. For sure. These were just loops of video taken before. This is a psychology experiment looking okay. at how people behave okay. in various circumstances. Okay, yeah. So tell me how you were feeling. Uh, mainly a bunch of terror and terror. Um, responsibility because I was at the helm and um, just horrified about making a decision between like five people compared to one. Um, it was very scary to say the least. It was scary. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. What was going through your mind as the train's coming down the track? It was mainly to warn them. They're, uh, it just what's coming up, what's coming up right now? You don't want to have to choose between people. Right. And that was really tough. Either like six families or one family. It was like, up to me it felt like. Yeah. It was interesting to me that you had such presence of mind yeah look for help and make a decision the one that everyone if you ask them in a survey says that they would like to be brave enough to make yes so that was impressive Corey. it really was thank you you know i i think it would be good to have you meet some of the people who participated so awesome. you can see yeah let's go do that just follow us on out meet the actors awesome. Corey showed us just how important the debrief was in this situation. Meeting the actors, which all of our subjects did, reinforced that this was not a reality. I was so bad that this was a story. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Like every time I watch this, I just uh, really feel sorry for him. It's like to have to go through this sort of thing, it's. Uh, He's not gonna forget this anytime soon. And this kind of distress, uh, it's something that needs to be dealt with very, very carefully. Any IRB is going to ask a lot of questions. And even though here he seems fairly okay, I think his emotional reaction, uh, you know, this guy over here who's the TV host was gonna let, let, let it go and maybe overcome this. But this psychologist that was there actually prompted for 
for his feelings. And then it became very clear that nothing was okay. And uh, I think this is gonna stay with him for a very long time. All these participants, you know, now they're going to have to live with knowing what kind of decisions they would have done if this would be a real situation. None of us have this kind of, of experience. And whatever whatever they experienced in that, it's it's not something that you that you easily easily forget. So how to conduct this kind of experiments? What is ethical to do in experiments like that? Um, fa fascinating stuff. It's amazing that the TV show was able to to do this. Just see the the level of uh, of detail over there. So there's just a lot going on. A lot of money invested in this only for um, a handful. And you saw at the beginning, they mentioned this very briefly, that most people said that they actually would not, uh, would, they, they actually did not change, change the track. He's one of uh, two that actually uh, did. So even though, just like the psychologist, um, the TV hosts were saying, most people indicate in the trolley dilemma that they would actually uh, change to the one person, uh, only two. Out of the out of the seven, I think uh, actually actually did this. So fascinating stuff. It's not clear what the association is between what people say they will do in a trolley dilemma and what they actually do. Uh, more research needs to be done. Not necessarily with this kind of setup. I'm going to show you some other things right after the break of uh, what we actually do in trolley dilemmas with real implications for. Uh, not one or two persons, but for our entire society. So that's something to look forward to. So we've seen that trolley dilemma can, from a very simplified scenario, be applied to all sorts of real life uh, scenarios. But still, when we think about the trolley dilemmas, you know, we think maybe it applies to this kind of scenario, the surgeon in the hospital, maybe you know, very specific types of context, um, we, we didn't have a good idea of how our experiments with the trolley dilemma uh, have relevance for the, for the entire, entire society. We drafted some uh, cool uh, changes to the trolley dilemma. Let's tweak this, let's tweak that. There's a bridge, there's a stranger, there's a friend. You now these kinds of things, is it mice or is it a TV show with the real life? Cool, cool stuff. But what's the, what's the practical implications of this? Uh, now we know in the last five, 10 years, that this has immense practical implications because we're facing the situation where um, our society is shifting towards uh, moral, moral machines. Self-driving autonomous vehicles is one example. So when I was uh, living in, in Europe, I was not too far away from Germany. And during the time that I was there, Western Germany in Dusseldorf and the area announced that they are starting their first pilot for these self-driving autonomous vehicles driving in the roads. Um, at the same time, Tesla and Google launched their first self-driving autonomous vehicles uh, saying that they're testing this in real, in real roads. So the question of what would happen in situations where there's a mechanical break, let's say the car is, you know, the brake is lost or there's, uh, you know, it's driving at a certain speed and somebody jumps uh, into, into the road. A lot of unexpected things can go wrong uh, in a real life scenario. Until now, we've trusted human beings or at least we let human beings uh, do their own thing. We punish behavior like, uh, driving drunk or not paying attention by playing on your mobile. But generally, we allowed each person to react based on gut instinct to these kinds of situations because we thought that people have a, a certain sense of, of morality. Now, it's becoming clear that we're going to have, at some point in the not too far away future, 5, 10, 20 years, we're going to have millions of these cars programmed by companies like the German companies or Tesla or Google and others with code that decides on these kinds of situations. Should we set these kinds of morality paradigms? How should we decide on this? Should we let the Google developer somewhere in a, in a room in Silicon Valley decide this for us? How does the coder decide these sort of things? Should we get 
a group of philosophers, social psychologists, economists to decide this for us? Should we vote on this? Should we allow people to um, code their own cars? Or should we allow people to sit and define these kind of situations, solving trolley dilemmas for the first, let's say, five hours of them sitting in their car? How should we approach this kind of situation where we're going to have uh, millions of machines, self-driving autonomous vehicles that are making these kinds of decisions? This paper in 2018 came out in Nature. So science and nature are our top journals. Uh, it doesn't happen very often that social psychologists uh, publish uh, things in that, in that journal. And it's fascinating what it is that they've done. I'm going to play a quick video to explain what they've done. This is probably the largest scale social psychology experiment ever attempted. We're talking by now, um, I think they've arrived at hundreds of millions of, of people participating and taking part in, in this experiment. Uh, mind blowing, really revolutionary stuff. The, the best experiment that we could have hoped for in terms of taking everything possible with a trolley dilemma and putting it in one experiment. Let's see what they've done. Who would you save? The pedestrian in the road or the drivers in the car? It's not easy. And yet that's the kind of decision which millions of autonomous cars would have to make in the near future. We program the machine, but who do we tell it to save? That is the setup of the moral machine experiment. There are so many uh, moral decisions that we usually make uh, during the day we don't realize. In driverless cars, uh, these decisions will have to be implemented ahead of time. The goal was to, uh, to open this discussion to the public. Some decisions might seem simple. Should the car save a family of four or a cat? But what about a homeless person and their dog instead of a businessman? Or how about two athletes and an old woman instead of two school children? The problem was that there were so many combination, so many, so many possible accidents that it seemed impossible to investigate them all uh, using classic social science methods. Not only that, but how do people's culture and background affect the decisions that they make? The only option we had, really, was to turn it into a viral website. Of course, it's easier said than done, right? But that is exactly what the team managed to do. They turned these situations into an online task that people across the globe wanted to share and take part in. They gathered almost 40 million moral decisions taken from millions of online participants across 233 countries and territories from all around the world. The results are intriguing. First, there are three fundamental principles which hold true across the world. The main results of the paper for me are first, uh, the big three in people's preferences, which is save human, save the greater number, save the kids. And the second most interesting finding was the, the, the clusters. The, the clusters of countries with different moral profiles. The first cluster uh, included many Western countries. Uh, the second cluster had many uh, Eastern countries. And the third cluster had countries from uh, Latin America and also from former uh, French colonies. The, the cultural difference we find are, are sometimes hard to describe because they're multidimensional, but some of them are very striking, like uh, the fact that Eastern countries do not have such a strong preference for saving young lives. Uh, Eastern countries seem to be more respectful of older people, which I thought was uh, a very interesting finding. And it wasn't just age. One cluster showed an unexpectedly strong preference for saving women over men. I was also struck by the fact that French and the, su and the French subcluster was so interested in saving women. That was, yeah, that, I, I'm still not quite sure what's going on here. Another surprising finding concerned people's social status. Uh, on one side, we put uh, uh, male and female executives, and on the other side, we put a homeless person. The higher the economic inequality in a country, the more people were willing to spare the uh, executives at the cost of the homeless people. 
This work provides new insight into how morals change across cultures. It's really fascinating, fascinating stuff. It's remarkable that they've built this website. It's, uh, it's incredible. I really wish that at some point I'll be able to take some of our replication work and the stuff that we do in uh, my lab, uh, some of the things that you designed to be able to bring this to this kind of of website. Uh, basically, not only do they ask people to judge dilemma. So let's see, for example, here, what should the self-driving car do? Should it hit this uh, jogger over here just by going straight and not deviating at all? Or should it divert and uh, hit this one woman who is not jogging? And if you want a little bit more of a description, then you can see that you have one female athlete uh, versus one woman, but this requires deviating to that side. So you can choose one of the two. You can create a profile. If you do enough of these, they will give you a summary of your morality so that we can compare uh, between individuals. You can compare this to other people that you know that are on this that are on this website. So that's really interesting. But the most remarkable thing is that they realize that they can't program all these by themselves and they want to give people the flexibility. So you can go on the design, you can give a scenario title, you can select from pedestrian versus pedestrians or pedestrians uh, in the car versus pedestrians. Uh, you know, so if you divert, you hit this wall, thereby killing everybody over here. You can also vary whether the people who are crossing the streets do this with a green light or a red light or perhaps no light. So let's say, for example, it's supposed to be a red light over here. And then you want to say uh, who is actually on, on the lane. So uh, let's say there's a cat and there's a woman and there's a jogger. And then who is in the car? Let's say uh, the only dogs are driving the car. So uh, do you want to kill all the, the dogs who are driving the car or do you want to hit the cat, the jogger uh, and the woman? So fascinating stuff. Finally, you can submit this and this will become part of their, their archives and they will be able to draw some conclusions from this. You can also vary if they're injured or uncertain, whether they're killed. So remarkable. It's, it's the most impressive social psychology experiment that, that I've ever seen. Uh, definitely putting an end to everything that we've done with trolley uh, dilemmas. No, no longer need for us to study the, the usual trolley dilemmas. Everything is uh, on this website. Now we need to uh, examine things with uh, uh, twists. So for example, with mice, uh, for example, looking at trust of how people respond to these kinds of things. Uh, but really, um, I wish social psychologists would, would move more towards these kinds of, of website, large scale, uh, hundreds of millions of responses. In 2018, they had 40 million. You know, two, two years later, by now their database is huge and has all possible scenarios, everything that you can think of. Then they keep improving this. So this is social psychologists teaming up with computer scientists. So if there are any computer scientists among you or your friends who want to come work with me on stuff like that, come and talk to me. I am very, very interested. That would be amazing. Uh, we have 100, 100 replications by the end of the year, including yours. Uh, and there's some stuff that we can do in order to translate this into this kind of, of website. Some of the insights, so they were talking about these three clusters, the Western, the Eastern, and the Southern one. And you can see all the principles of morality. So some cultures emphasize some um, principles over others. So it seems like the Southern cultures care more about you know, sparing high status, or sparing the young. Uh, whereas uh, if we look at these Eastern cultures, sparing pedestrians, sparing humans, sparing the lawful, so they care more about law. And then the Western ones uh, seem to, um, you know, omission bias, preference for inaction is more pronounced. If we look at this, there's some really curious stuff over here. So uh, zero here is no change. Everything towards the right uh, emphasizes the right side over the left side. So definitely there's a bit of a, a, a preference for, for inaction. The three principles that they discussed in the video, sparing humans, sparing more lives, and sparing the young seem to be uh, the, the, the most critical moral principles. But then there's some really curious stuff, like can, can you see this? Sparing the large versus sparing the fit. So people would rather spare the fit. And then they also discussed a bit, a bit like sparing females. Um, so, so very, very interesting uh, thing is, if you look at the rankings of who is going to be spared, you really 
you know, scratch your head and it's like, what is, what is going on over here? There's some really curious, curious uh, stuff goes on over here. So stroller like a baby is the highest one. Then you have the pregnant. So a woman with a baby uh, in her uh, is higher than any regular uh, woman. They have things like a large woman. So a regular woman is one thing, but a large woman is lower than that. Large men lower than that. Homeless people, a criminal is less than a dog. I'm just like, there's some stuff over here that, that's fascinating. Uh, can Decades of research can come out from this, from this um, sort of, of website and their insights that they have. Now, the question is, um, we, so we had this kind of insight. What, what gonna happen once we have these insights? Are we just going to install this in, in the car? Um, will people buy these cars? So let's say that we've decided to be utilitarian. So we want to save the most cars. And we've installed this in our self-driving autonomous vehicles. What would happen? Would people actually buy these cars or not? So let's hear from the same team about uh, what they've done, uh, research uh, that they've done on this. So this is what we did with my collaborators, Jean-Francois Bonafon and Azim Sharif, we ran a survey in which we presented people with these types of scenarios. And we gave them two options, inspired by two philosophers, Jeremy Bentham and Immanuel Kant. Bentham says the car should follow utilitarian ethics. It should take the action that will minimize total harm, even if that action will kill a bystander, and even if that action will kill the passenger. Immanuel Kant says, the car should follow duty-bound principles, like thou shalt not kill. So you should not take an action that explicitly harms a human being, and you should let the car take its course, even if that's going to harm more people. What do you think? Bentham or Kant? Here's what we found. Most people sided with Bentham. So it seems that people want cars to be utilitarian, minimize total harm, and that's what we all should all do. Problem solved. But there is a little catch. When we asked people whether they would purchase such cars, they said, absolutely not. <laughs> they would like to buy cars that protect them at all costs, but they want everybody else to buy cars that minimize harm. <laughs> Therein lies the dilemma. What do you do in this kind of situation? So this is typical judgment and decision-making biases that we study, uh, the kind of replications that we do, the kind of projects that we run in my lab. So uh, no longer hypothetical scenarios. This is going to be implemented five, 10 years. We're gonna have these cars. Who gets to decide? What should we do? Do we force people to do this sort of thing as governments? Uh, there's also the additional issue of, um, you know, do we want to define different morality for different countries? Think of all the other strange situations you need to. So I actually, I, I framed another uh, dilemma uh, for you. And this dilemma is over here with autonomous uh, cars. What? <laughs> I've never seen this before. The first... Uh, um, so you're about to purchase an autonomous self-driving vehicle. The self-driving vehicle morality needs to be set and you need to choose from either answer trolley dilemma moral decisions for five hours, choose the default factory morality setting or not configure morality settings at all and the car will randomly uh, decide what to do. So that's interesting. While you're answering this, uh, if you would like to, uh, I'm gonna share with you one example for a very interesting study that was done in Sweden. What they have in Sweden, uh, and I've experienced this when I was living in Europe, is that if you go and recycle, you bring your uh, plastics or your cans or everything, your uh, bottles, you bring those to the supermarket. Next to the, uh, to the supermarket, there's a recycling machine. And if you put everything in for each bottle that you put in, you get back um, a refund, kind of uh, money that you can use to buy things in the supermarket. Now, what they've done is that in some of the Swedish, the Swedish uh, um, recycling uh, machines, what they've done is that they introduced another option where instead of using the, the, the money that you get from the recycling, you can actually donate this to charity. Uh, but what they found is, is that 
once they've introduced this kind of option into the recycling machines, the recycling on these machines went down considerably. But when they looked at the total recycling of the entire region, what they found is that the recycling stayed exactly the same. So what was going on is that people did not like to have to face the kind of moral dilemma of whether to use the kind of money from recycling or to give it to someone else. So they would drive extra to go to a different supermarket with a different recycling machine where they would not have to face this kind of situation. They could go to the same kind of recycling machine and just choose not to donate, but they would rather not have to face this than feel guilt over this kind of situation. So fascinating study by this uh, Swedish group uh, over here. Um, like for the one person who uh, said answer a trolley dilemma moral decisions for five hours to configure, I urge you to go on the moral machine website, forget five hours, sit one hour and, and answer these trolley dilemma. <laughs> you will go, you will go crazy. It, it's, uh, it's very, it's very intense. And uh, the last thing that people usually want to do when they get into their new cars is before the car starts driving to sit down and answer trolley dilemma uh, scenarios for, for five hours. So just uh, contemplate what it is that you would do in this kind of situation. Don't just uh, you know, hypothesize, actually go to the moral machines and test yourself and see if, if uh, you can stand this kind of, of decision. Now, if this still seems distant to you, then I am going to show you that uh, these trolley dilemma issues have real uh, implications, not for 5, 10, 20 years from now with these self-driving autonomous vehicles, but it has you know, implications for us now with this pandemic. So ask yourself this. Uh, right now in Hong Kong, we're doing fairly well. Uh, good job. Uh, very, uh, we're very lucky over here. But most of the people that I know in uh, Europe and in the US, uh, uh, other places in the, in the world where, where I lived and visited, friends that I have all over the world, they're really struggling. And the situation over there is, is bad. And the problem is, is that you have a lot of COVID patients, but you have a very limited number of ventilators. And the question is, who gets the priority for ventilators? So imagine uh, the moral machines website you know who who would you let live who would you kill who would you prioritize over others uh, so is it uh, the pregnant woman or is it the jogger or is it a large woman or is it so all these scenarios you think this is funny but for the people in the hospital that need to make this kind of decisions it's it's a real issue it's happening right now not in five ten years it's everyday life situation uh, limited number of ventilators and then the question is who do you prioritize would you prioritize, let's say that you have a kid and an elderly, would you prioritize the kid over the elderly? If you have a nurse or a doctor over somebody, somebody else, would you prioritize the doctor and the nurse uh, because they might be able to help others uh, after, what, after that? If you think this is a simple decision, how about if somebody is already hooked to a ventilator, you ran out of ventilators and then comes a nurse or a doctor or a kid, uh, do you disconnect an elderly that's already connected to, to the ventilators. Who is going to do that? Are people capable of, of, of this, these kinds of actions? Not hypothetical. It happens every day, today, around the world. Who gets to decide this? Should we have a policy? Who gets to implement this? Under what circumstances? Uh, if it's not enough about ventilators, it's also going to happen for us here in Hong Kong. So there's the question of uh, at the beginning, we're not going to have a vaccine for, for everybody. And if we want to travel the world, if we want to go back to our normal lives, if we want to be uh, healthy, let's say that there's the COVID vaccine and it's absolutely safe. Uh, it's been approved. We know that it's going to uh, work, uh, but we have a limited number of vaccines. Who gets priority over others? Uh, would you give one to politicians over professors? Would you give one to uh, bankers over uh, hospital workers? Uh, should it be a matter of money? Uh, obviously, if it's money, we have enough billionaires and millionaires in Hong Kong, and they might take uh, all the first uh, vaccines available, not leaving this for uh, marginalized societies who are actually under much uh, higher risk 
for this sort of thing. So if you're working in a hospital, you're putting yourself at risk of, of uh, get, getting, getting uh, COVID. So who gets to decide? Should we control this? Should we limit the way that this is distributed? Trolley dilemma in every, uh, every step of the way with this COVID uh, situation. So I wanna show you a number of studies that, that came out in the last year since the COVID started. So this is about uh, you know, ventilators and vaccines, uh, how to prioritize this. So at least when the vaccine comes, uh, this group in the US uh, suggested these phases, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. You can see that in phase one, they prioritize the high risk uh, health workers, doctors, nurses, first responders, um, and then uh, second phase, you know, teachers and school staff, child care workers, so they'll be able to take care of, of the, the, the kids. But there's also some really interesting things that were very controversial. So for example, you can see here in phase two, people in prisons, jail, detention centers, and similar facilities. What, why is that? Why would you prioritize them, let's say, over yourselves? Um, they, they've sinned against society, they've done, they've done wrong, but they're serving their sentences, they have no control over their environment, they have no free will, their space is limited, and there are, uh, they are at uh, our mercy. So um, if we want to protect ourselves, we can. If they want to protect themselves, a uh, very limited situation, limited space, everybody uh, together, and in the US, the prisons are the highest, uh, uh, some of the highest rates of contracting the, the COVID. So um, sometimes we need to prioritize marginalized societies, um, high status people, people with money can protect themselves. They can, they have, you know, big houses, they have their own cars, they have means of, of isolating themselves from societies. They go and live on their island and then everything is okay. But the people in lower status, first of all, they lack the means. Um, they, they lack the ability to say, I'm not going to work. Uh, and they are serving, they are uh, working, they are uh, in our society uh, doing the best that they can, but they have limited funds and availability uh, of, of uh, means to address the, the COVID situation. So we need, to, we need to help them and prioritize them. And I think this is the logic behind this. It's a very long, I didn't have a chance to read the whole document, but I found this uh, fascinating, this uh, four phases. Uh, and then of course the young adults and the children. So uh, years uh, to be lived is, is uh, another factor before getting this to everybody else. You can see also some of the principles that we've seen before, perhaps also in your, your own ranking, but definitely in the moral machines about saving the most life, saving the most years of life and the life cycle principle in terms of uh, what, what age what age you're on and what kind of symptoms do you have, prognosis for, for survival. And this is about the ventilator allocation. Uh, I really recommend if you have the time, one of my favorite podcasts, The Feconomics, uh, this one uh, taught me a lot. Um, who gets the ventilator? So they talk to a long specialist, a bioethicist and an economist. Um, so the way that I got introduced to this group was through the uh, Freakonomics Radio. So it's not exactly my, my field, but I try through Twitter, through podcasts to keep track of what's happening and see how things like the trolley dilemma, moral psychology, judgment and decision-making is being applied in everyday life. And these things are really um, affecting uh, things right now with the COVID pandemic. There are all sorts of different problems that I wanted you to uh, contemplate. Um, I'm gonna uh, skip skip this for 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 now, and I'm gonna gonna just summarize uh, these things for you. You can think about these things as as I as I present them. So imagine yourself in this kind of. I'm just gonna um, move ahead. So if you want to answer this, you can. So we have three scenarios over here. Uh, will you save the little girl? Will you save the little girl? So we have three scenarios over here and you can answer these on the Mentimeter if you want. I'm just gonna explain the scenario. Let's say that you're walking on a bridge. You can see a bridge is a repeating theme in moral psychology. So you're walking on the bridge. It's above a river this time. There's a little girl uh, that's, that's uh, drowning. She needs your help. But the thing is you just came out of an interview and you're wearing this very expensive 1,000 US dollars suit. 
uh, that you need in order to uh, be able to get your jobs or attend job interviews, would you jump to the water ruining your suit uh, to save this little girl? Uh, what would you what would you say to this kind of scenario? So I think so okay, before I tell you what this the answer is, uh, imagine a similar scenario. And this time the girl is not next to you in the uh, water under the bridge and you don't see it, but there's a, a girl that's dying. It's very clear that she's dying somewhere in South America and uh, 1000 US dollars. If you donate this, uh, you can guarantee that this girl will live. What's the difference between these two scenarios? Would you answer these two, two differently? Most people, when they're confronted with this kind of scenario, they will say, hell yeah, I will jump definitely without hesitating. I will do everything that I can in order to save this little girl. So then the question is, if you would save this girl, why wouldn't you save this girl? Like, what's the difference between them? And if you're saying, okay, it's because she is in South America. So I don't know people in South America. They're, they're not my concern. Or you can sell sort of things I don't know if what I contribute is going to really lead to her. I don't trust as you know all, all sorts of other considerations. How about a, a third um, version of this? So for example, one of the uh, so this was the, would you save the the little girl in South America? So uh, for the first one, the three of you that answered, you said that you will save the girl. Would you save the one in South America? <laughs> You said that you will save the girl. So right now there's uh, real ways for you to spend um, a thousand US dollars. Get in touch with me after the lecture and I will tell you exactly which websites would guarantee that 1000 US dollars that you um, that you donate now would save somebody uh, today uh, in, in South America. If we look at the third one, what would you do with your next door neighbor? So if you say this is too far away, South America, not my concern, how about somebody uh, that, that you know that, that is in your building that you see uh, on a regular basis, would you help that person uh, or not? And there are real ways for you to, uh, to, 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 to do this sort of thing, but most people say no to the second, uh, to the second scenario. Um, other kinds of biases that people have in this situation is that, uh, for example, if we ask people, how much would you, so this is a between subject design, so you only see one of these versions, we can't run this in the class, uh, our sample is not big enough, but I did run this in Fundamentals of Social Psychology, and it was a very successful replication. So one group gets to see only Rokia, and we ask, uh, given a middle class Hong Kong student status, how much would you donate to save Rokia? A different group is uh, I show Rokia with Musa and I say, how much would you uh, donate to Rokia and Musa? So if we would be logical, let's say, you know, we, wa we want to help these two kids, uh, we would say double or at least at the very least be the same amount of money. So let's say that we we'll have limited ability and we want to donate everything that we can. It would be the same sum for Rokia as it would be for Rokia and Musa. But that is not the case. What you can actually see is that people have a hard time. They, they, you know, something that is identifiable, it's personalized, they can handle this. But the more people that you introduce, uh, the less people are willing to donate. So people are actually considerably lower money donated to two people, uh, even if individually uh, they, they are uh, don donating, donating more. Uh, so that's that's odd, and it seems like the more you increase the number of lives involved, the less people are willing to are are, are capable of of, of grasping uh, the, these kinds of of numbers and being able to handle this. Uh, a similar thing that we did: two thousand uh, birds compared to saving uh, twenty thousand birds. How much would you uh, pay? And the remarkable thing is that for the first one, people said eighty U.S. dollars. For the second one, 78 US dollars, but this is 10 times more. What's, what's the logic uh, over here? Um, that's, that's really uh, uh, interesting in that. And this is our replication. So you can see in Fundamentals of Social Psychology, we had 53 uh, subject and you can see <laughs> that Rocky and Musa, it's amazing. You know, I gave them a range between zero Hong Kong dollars to a thousand Hong Kong dollars. People actually said they're going to donate less to Rocky and Musa. And just look at this. A thousand birds or a million birds. 
You can see people donated 2,000 birds, 175, 2 million birds, 110. Uh, explain, explain that to me. A fascinating thing in judgment and decision making. And recently, we also had a replication uh, that we submitted to one of the journals. You can see all the uh, students that were involved in this sort of thing. I think you'll recognize two of our tutors over here. And uh, we were able to uh, successfully replicate one study out of the two. And the one that didn't replicate, we came up with some uh, really uh, interesting insights as to why that didn't replicate very well. But I think this is a, a solid phenomena. And they uh, summarize this as insensitivity to the value of human life. It's not that we value uh, one human life as X and two human lives as two X. Uh, we do some computation in our minds in order to try and, and establish how much we should we should donate. Um, this is from Max Bezerman, which I uh, mentioned uh, last time. And this are all sorts of rules of thumb that he suggests in order for us to uh, do well when we make these kinds of moral decisions. We need to define the problem, identify the criteria, weight the criteria, generate the alternatives. So rather than using our intuition, which we saw is biased, we are unable to intuitively answer questions of morality and donation uh, well, uh, we need to apply some principles. We really need to switch to our more deliberate system mode in order to get to the optical, to the optimal uh, decision and then we have all sorts of principles that we can apply in order to make sure that we've we've made the right uh, decision um max also together with other moral psychologists have done some remarkable work on things like the veil of ignorance so for example if you strip the question of whether it's about you or about uh, somebody else so if you remove the self other bias people answer in a less biased uh, way if you remove uh, things like identity um, in-group, out-group bias gets out of the way. So you can do all sorts of things when you have a medical uh, dilemma, a real donation decision. You can do all sorts of things in order to try and remove the bias and get to a more accurate uh, perception. This one is about the veil of ignorance and how uh, anonymizing things can help you de-bias. So you hide the, the target. Finally, the last uh, thing I want to show you, let's see how much time we have. We have about eight minutes. I'll try to show you as much as I can of this. It's a, it's a movement, effective altruism. It's a group of uh, psychologists, uh, philosophers, economists, uh, mathematicians that came together and said, we want to maximize morality. We want to maximize the good in the world. And there are efficient ways to do that. I'm going to show you two uh, videos where Peter Singer, who is one of the uh, leaders or the initiators of this kind of, of movement, I strongly recommend that you look at the uh, entire video. I'm going to mention effective altruism in, in uh, future uh, lectures. It's inspiring, it's, uh, it's growing, it's uh, impactful. It's uh, one of the best ways that you can, if you want to, do more good in the world, how to maximize your contribution, your donation, your involvement in doing more good in this world. So here's Peter Singer and the Effective, effective Altruism Movement. There's something that I'd like you to see. It's a story that's deeply unsettled millions in China. Footage of a two-year-old girl hit by a van and left bleeding in the street by passers-by. Footage too graphic to be shown. The entire accident is caught on camera. The driver pauses after hitting the child, his back wheels seen resting on her for over a second. Within two minutes, three people pass two-year-old Wang Yu Bai. The first walks around the badly injured toddler completely. Others look at her before moving off. There were other people who walked past Wang Yu and a second van ran over her legs before a street cleaner raised the alarm. She was rushed to hospital, but it was too late. She died. I wonder how many of you, looking at that, said to yourselves just now, I would not have done that. I would have stopped to help. Raise your hands if that thought occurred to you. As I thought, that's most of you. And I believe you, I'm sure you're right. But before you give yourself too much credit, 
Look at this. UNICEF reports that in 2011, 6.9 million children under five died from preventable poverty-related diseases. UNICEF thinks that that's good news because the figure has been steadily coming down from 12 million in 1990. And that is good. But still, 6.9 million is 19,000 children dying every day. Does it really matter that we're not walking past them in the street? Does it really matter that they're far away? I don't think it does make a morally relevant difference. The fact that they're not right in front of us, the fact, of course, that they're of a different nationality or race, none of that seems morally relevant to me. What is really important is, can we reduce that death toll? Can we save some of those 19,000 children dying every day? And the answer is, yes, we can. Each of us spends money on things that we do not really need. You can think what your own habit is, whether it's a new car, a vacation, or just something like buying bottled water when the water that comes out of the tap is perfectly safe to drink. You could take the money you're spending on those unnecessary things and give it to this organization, the Against Malaria Foundation, which would take the money you had given and use it to buy nets like this one to protect children like this one. And we know reliably that if we provide nets, they're used and they reduce the number of children dying from malaria, just one of the many preventable diseases that are responsible for some of those 19,000 children dying every day. Fortunately, more and more people are understanding this idea and the result is a growing movement, effective altruism. It's important because it combines both the heart and the head. The heart, of course, you felt. You felt the empathy for that child. But it's really important to use the head as well to make sure that what you do is effective and well-directed. And not only that, but also I think reason helps us to understand that other people, wherever they are, are like us, that they can suffer as we can, that parents grieve for the deaths of their children as we do, and that just as our lives and our well-being matters to us, it matters just as much to all of these people. So I think reason is not just some neutral tool to help you get whatever you want, it does help us to put perspective on our situation. And I think that's why Many of the most significant people in effective altruism have been people who've had backgrounds in philosophy or economics or math. Yes, so a group of people, social scientists, um, who, who are involved in this kind of, of movement and are doing remarkable things. I'm gonna show you in the remaining minutes that we have uh, just two out of the four amazing initiatives that came out of effective altruism. So let's have a look at this, and by this, we're going to finish the lecture for today. That's fine if you're a billionaire, you can have that kind of impact. But if I'm not, what can I do? So I'm going to look at four questions that people ask that maybe stand in the way of them giving. They worry how much of a difference they can make, but you don't have to be a billionaire. This is Toby Ord. He's a research fellow in philosophy at the University of Oxford. He became an effective altruist when he calculated that with the money that he was likely to earn throughout his career, an academic career, he could give enough to cure 80,000 people of blindness in developing countries and still have enough left for a perfectly adequate standard of living. So Toby founded an organization called Giving What We Can to spread this information, to unite people who want to share some of their income and to ask people to pledge to give 10% of what they earn over their lifetime to fighting global poverty. Toby himself does better than that. He's pledged to live on 18,000 pounds 
a year, that's less than $30,000, and to give the rest to those organizations. And yes, Toby is married, and he does have a mortgage. This is a couple at a later stage of life, Charlie Bressler and Diana Schott, who when they were young, when they met, were activists against the Vietnam War, fought for social justice, and then moved into careers, as most people do, didn't really do anything very active about those values, although they didn't abandon them. And then as they got to the age at which many people start to think of retirement, they returned to them, and they've decided to cut back on their spending, to live modestly, and to give both money and time to helping to fight global poverty. Now, mentioning time might lead you to think, well, should I abandon my career and put all of my time into saving some of these 19,000 lives that are lost every day? One person who's thought quite a bit about this issue of how you can have a career that will have the biggest impact for good in the world is Will Cratch. He's a graduate student in philosophy. And he set up a website called 80,000 Hours, the number of hours he estimates most people spend on their career, to advise people on how to have the best, most effective career. But you might be surprised to know that one of the careers that he encourages people to consider if they have the right abilities and character is to go into banking or finance. Why? Because if you earn a lot of money, you can give away a lot of money. And if you're successful in that career, you could give enough to an aid organization so that it could employ, let's say, five aid workers in developing countries. And each one of them would probably do about as much good as you would have done. You can see where this is going. Uh, it's, it's amazing. So I think it really changes perspective on our ability to do good in this world. I really appreciate each and every one of these people who he mentioned. I appreciate him. I appreciate the effect of altruism. It's not without criticism, but I think uh, they really get people to think about how to best use their lives, how to best use their money, how to best use their time in order to do good in this world. So I highly recommend go and look into these websites, have a look at 80,000 hours, have a look at effective altruism and see how you can maximize the good that you do in this world. So that's it for us for this week. Uh, we'll come back and talk uh, more next week about this and other topics. If you have any questions, think that you want to discuss, very happy to uh, find me on Slack.